Welcome to Soapbox. I'm your host tonight, James Israel. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the new California pot legalization initiative that's coming up uh, this year on the ballot, uh, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, AUMA. And uh, I'll be talking to Dale Schaefer, a Sacramento attorney. Uh, before we get to that, though, let's talk about, let me tell you about the sponsors tonight. We have uh, Pieces Pizza by the Slice including low-fat, vegan, and gluten-free options, as well as a fine selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. We thank them for supplying pizza for the crew, and uh, you can find them on 21st Street in Sacramento, 441-1949 is the phone number. Also, the Humor Times, which bills itself as the world's funniest news source. The monthly political humor magazine is available worldwide by subscription, in print and digital format. Subscription info along with cartoons, funny fake news, videos and more can be found at humortimes.com. Also sponsored by Doctors Clinic for Men, Sacramento's only clinic devoted to the treatment of erectile dysfunction. For more information, go to sacdc4m at, uh, or dot com or call them at 916 Four eight two fifty two hundred. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you're on Facebook, please check in on our Facebook page and comment on our shows or bring up anything you'd like to at facebook.com soapbox sack. And also don't forget to check out our archive of past shows on the YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and uh, put soapbox Sacramento in the search box there and you'll come up with uh, with our page there, which you see on screen. Um, and you can watch uh, all the old shows there. It's all archived. Um, and I hope you will share some of those show shows with your friends. Uh, tonight, we're talking about the California initiative coming up this year, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, AUMA. It's qualified for the ballot in November. And it's setting the stage for a vote that uh, could have ramifications even beyond California. So my guest is uh, Dale Schaefer. He's a Sacramento attorney who has studied the initiative and uh, given some uh, talks about it, some presentations. Um, and uh, so you, you've become pretty familiar with the act and um, you've been involved in the, the whole issue. Uh, you even spent some time in jail over uh, marijuana, I understand. 10 months out of federal prison. So yeah, I did spend some time. I did a five-year minimum mandatory sentence. And I've been involved in this since 1997 uh, when the mother of my children got breast cancer. Mm. And we had to find ways to help deal with chemotherapy. And it, she was a physician. One thing led to another. We started doing recommendations under 215. 420 came along, got very familiar with that. Um, and now as we have built to a place where Prop 19 failed in 2010 for many of the, the reasons they're screaming about right now. We now have a chance to, coupled with some recent state legislation that was signed by the governor last year, bring things under regulatory control uh, to ease some of the restrictions, create some safe harbors for people to be able to use cannabis without being subject to any criminal penalties whatsoever and generally lowers a lot. It does a lot more than that. Um, I, my focus is on the human and civil rights aspects of this and trying to wind down the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And this should um, push pretty heavily against the war on drugs. Right. It would seem to me that the easiest part of the war on drugs to fix is to just decriminalize or legalize marijuana. It just seems to be one of the most difficult parts of it to do mm -hmm. for a multitude of reasons, well entrenched flows of money and power and capital and all sorts of things like that. Yeah, uh, the Rolling Stone called it uh, the pot law that could be a deal breaker for the drug war. Um, and they uh, point out, you know, what you're talking about there. Um, also, the fact that we have one-tenth of the population in the United States right here in California, and then uh, legalizing it here coupled with uh, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, basically the whole West Coast is, will mm -hmm. be legal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's going to, I would think, be a big push towards getting all the dominoes to fall, finally, after all these decades. 
Well, one would hope so. If you look at what happened when uh, Prop 215 passed in 96, Washington was just full of anxiety about what these crazy hippies had done in California. Mm -hmm. And as it rolled out and the sky didn't fall, despite their best efforts to try and rein this back in, we saw many people across the country be able to ask the question, well, if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? People are dying, children are having seizures. There's a lot of problems that compel uh, the heartstrings to look at this. Now, California is the linchpin. It's the, the crown and the jewel, the jewel and the crown, if you will, to changing the momentum. The four states that have legalized so far don't equal parts of Southern California in population mm -hmm. and in political power. So if this does um, go legal for recreational purposes, then there's going to be a huge crack in the dam. It may burst some of the dam wide open. The blockage to further rolling back the war on drugs. Right. We, can, we can only hope. Right. Plus, it'll have a big um, impact on the cartels bringing that cell pot um, over the border, I would think, you know, because uh, all of a sudden the financial, uh, what makes that financially viable will be gone uh, because it'll be so easily accessible and legally accessible in well, California. That, that's true as a general statement. Unfortunately, um, there's, there was a trade-off um, to get the initiative onto the ballot and also to get the what's called MAMERSA, the Medical Marijuana Regulation Safety Act, through the legislature. It's going to be very tightly controlled and it's going to be taxed. Um, the price of marijuana today is not based upon production costs. It's based upon, in large part, a comparison to the black market. Mm. And they can drop their costs quicker than a legitimate business person can. And we've had meetings with Lori Ajax, who's the, the, the marijuana czar in the Department of Consumer Affairs, and she's been told very clearly, mm -hmm. if you too tightly wrap this up, the black market's just going to thrive. Mm -hmm. They've had two generations, maybe three, to become well entrenched in California. And there's a lot of what I call transient growers, carpet baggers, if you will, that move around wherever they think the best place to grow is. And they're trashing our national forests. They're, they're ruining mm -hmm. our streams, a lot of things are not good about what they're doing and ultimately the way to get rid of them is to drive the price so low that it's not cost effective for them to go risk what they're doing. Right. And uh, that is one of the controversial aspects of it is the the tax rates, right? Mm -hmm. um, some uh, some counties or places could still uh, charge as much as 20% 20, 20 tax or something like that. Is that right? Well, without going to the voters for an initiative, they're limited in what they can do for sales taxes. Fees, though, are not tied to a reasonable relationship to, to monitoring and enforcing. So they can call things fees, and some of those will be litigated. The Prop 64 is now the number it's been given, has a $2.25, I mean, a, a $9.25 per ounce tax on bud and two seventy five per ounce of shake. And that mm. is substantial. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some questions who's going to collect it right now. Um, the MAMERSA, or the, the law that's on the books right now, the medical one that the governor signed, doesn't have a tax in it, allows fees. But if Prop 64 doesn't pass, they will bring that same tax structure. It's already been tried to be run through the legislature a couple of times. It's been stopped. Uh, if Prop 64 passes, then production will be taxed significantly at the cultivator level, most likely. Um, the Rolling Stone article I was referencing said uh, the measure itself would impose a 15% retail tax on cannabis. An excise tax, yeah, across the board. Okay. And then there's sales tax, and then there's local taxes. Mm. So that, that could definitely add up quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the initiative would set up uh, a lot of different kinds of licenses, uh, distribution, uh, growing, retailing. It starts with cultivation, and there's five levels, four of basically cultivation in the nurseries to be able to supply the plants to them. And then there's two types of manufacturers, depending on what type of solvents you have. There's testing, there's distribution, which is a brand new model. Uh, my family owned liquor stores when I was growing up, so for us, a distributor that would take taxes, put stamps on, was everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. For this industry, uh, people are up in arms about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's well-funded groups that are coming out of the alcohol business right now that have the experience to do it. 
they're beginning to step up. Right. and secure locations, uh, be able to lobby local jurisdictions for permits to be able to do this kind of thing so that cannabis will be brought in. It'll then be uh, looked at in a sort of a, a qualitative sense and out for testing. The taxes will be collected and put into a central database to show that these plants were put into a batch and taxed at the right rate mm. and then move through the system. And it's going to be tracked from seed to sale. And any government oversight scares people who are long in the tooth in this industry. They've been hiding in the shadows for a long time. If you're coming into it as a, a businessman, an entrepreneur that doesn't have the background of being afraid you're going to be arrested, then of course you go, well, of course we're going to be regulated, we're going to have rules, we're going to have taxes to pay, and I'm not looking to get outside the system. Mm -hmm. People who have been living outside the system, you're going to have to drag them in kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. And if they get back outside the system again, there's considerable fines that are going to be attached. Well, they're, uh, they've been operating that way for, for years. They're used to it. They know how to do it. So, yeah, changes, mm -hmm. changes can, be, uh, can be hard. Uh, I know a lot of people are also concerned about um, creating uh, that, that by laying this foundation, we're kind of laying a foundation for a big, a kind of a big tobacco takeover mm -hmm. of, uh, of marijuana. Um, now, I know there is uh, the provision in this law, though, that uh, holds the big gro growers back for a while, right? Five years, basically. So yeah. uh, speak, speak to that. Well, under um, Prop 64, the large-scale cultivators won't be able to be licensed for five years. So they're going to not allow people to have the, the gardens that are uh, an acre or more. Um, it's going to be kept smaller. There are... Um, vertical integration schemes where you can grow small gardens, you can process or manufacture as they call it, and dispense and be your own distributor as a vertically integrated group. They're supposed to get priority. Mm -hmm. Under the Medical Marijuana Regulation Safety Act, they specifically take people who are up and running as collectives now. That's the model we operate under. They're going to be given priority and be able to allow to be fully integrated for another five years. So there's going to be uh, an emphasis to keep this as small as you can for as long as you can. So that act that you just referenced, that was just passed um, a couple years ago through the legislature, right? It was signed in October of last just, year by the governor. Just last year, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and this dovetails pretty well with it, though, the way it was written. Well, it it's, new, uh, seems pretty clear to me that um, the what's now Prop 64 was being written and people were sharing notes mm -hmm. because what came out of the legislature, there were three bills that were gutted and then all this was added back into three bills that have a, um, a strict regulatory scheme. And when you hold it over Prop 64, they're almost line up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's hard for me to imagine yeah. that all this could be done without somebody on the phone or sharing some notes. Sure. And, and right now there's a, in the Department of Consumer Affairs, they're going to be the watchdog over this, the central agency. Um, food and agriculture is going to be over cultivation. Uh, public health will be over testing and manufacturing and everything else will be consumer affairs. If 64 passes, it will then subsume all of the medical and there will be two categories of licenses, medical and non-medical. You may be able to hold both for certain things. Um, the vertical integration in Prop 64 is basically unlimited except for testers. They're going to be mandated to be independent. They can't have anything to do with licenses and any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep the testing problems we have right now. They take um, product to four or five different labs and they all give you a different mm -hmm. printout of what's in it. Mm -hmm. Now, they can't all be wrong. Um, it seems who's right, we don't know. The state's going to step in with the Department of, of Weights and Scales and try to standardize weights of this stuff. Mm -hmm. The public health's going to step in and set standards so that you have controls in every lab that are going to be tested. They'll come in and make sure we put a control in there and, and it's going to better come out with what we know it's going to be. It's going do, you to be think, uh, do you think there's been some under the table activity there with the. With the uh, testing yeah. until now, yeah. Yeah, well, nobody trusts anybody. Right. And whenever somebody steps up to try and be, you know, the shining beacon, you go test what they're doing or look into a little further and you find, well, you know, your, your hat's a little crooked and you fell off your white horse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately, in this industry. It's hard to trust. And these products are not necessarily safe. And that's a, a huge issue 
for all of this regulation is to make sure that if you have a little kid having seizure that needs a ton of this medicine, you're not giving them pesticides or volatile solvents in the medicine they're getting because there's no right. guarantee now that you're not. Right. Um, the, they're doing a lot of, you know, they're finally getting around to doing testing on, the, on, the, uh, on marijuana. Uh, for a long time, it was even hard to do that because of the, of the being labeled a Schedule 1. You can't even do tests on mm -hmm. it. Um, but uh, they're finding out a lot about the CD, CBD uh, ingredients versus the, um, uh, which is uh, m more of the, it just uh, helps with medical issues. Uh, a lot of different medical issues from what I understand versus the THC which gets you high but uh, they're also finding that you can't really just separate the two completely because there are elements of the THC and the rest of the plant that um, are important for to make that CBD work as well mm -hmm. so you can have like you can minimize the THC but it does help with especially with certain things um, to have the whole plan in there. Well, there, there is an adjunct effect. The, the receptors, the, the CB1 receptors, they call it, it has um, a lock on it for THC, and it now they found it has one for CBD. And if you don't have the THC lock on a little bit, the CBD doesn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. And the way it's been described to me is the THC opens the door, mm -hmm. unlocks the door, mm -hmm. but CBD dictates how far the door opens. Uh -huh. Now, that's just sort of a rudimentary way of looking yeah. at it. Um, back in the day, they had 64 cannabinoids that they had identified, and now they're going to be testing for six or eight of them that are going to be labeled. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're testing for what they call terpenes. These are what give it its unique smell, mm. but they also have medicinal effects, which mm -hmm. are not well understood yet, but they're going to be tested by labs to see not only what's the THC, CBD, CBN, CBG, a whole bunch of these, mm. what is their level, but also the terpenes. Because it, I don't know if you ever looked at the names of this, but when I was seeing patients every day, especially older people would ask me, what should I get? And I said, well, be careful when you start looking into it because stone teenage boys named all this stuff. <laughs> and so they have some names that your grandma might blush at. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I was um, involved with early starting up of a medical group that's still going on. And they were trying to get it tested so they could have sort of a binomial system. Call it OG Kush or whatever you want to call it. What's its THC, CBD, CBM profile? And now this, the terpenoids. It's quite and, an alphabet soup in there. Well, yeah, but they're looking at some of the ratios now. There are some commercial products out there. Um, um, Sativex is one that's out in the market, which is a 50-50 mix. Epidiolex is another one that has more CBD in it, and it's an anti-seizure medication mm -hmm. that are sublinguals under the tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the testing's been done commercially. I think Bayer bought this company, and they've got it licensed in in Europe and in Canada, and it probably will be coming here if they reschedule this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the ratio of THC to CBD is something that bears a lot of attention because for a physician, and if they come into your office, the kids have having seizures, what do I do now? Well, what's my starting dose? What's my ratio I want to start at and then start to you know, go up or down from there? And I was talking to a, a, a guy who has a degree in um, chemistry and he extracts and then they custom blends much like a, a custom pharmacy does mm. but the physicians don't understand what they're doing mm -hmm. so there's a disconnect medical schools aren't teaching it pharmacy schools aren't teaching it you've got people who are smart operating equipment with an idea but an idea doesn't prove that it's doing what you think it does it's the medical community is a bit dubious because people think it cures cancer and hangnail and everything else, mm -hmm. and it may very well do that. Mm -hmm. But until you do the appropriate studies to show the mechanism that it does it by and the e efficacy of the treatment, then the medical community is a bit dubious. Because if kids mm -hmm. got cancer, you want the ca cancer to be cured. There are things that have been proven, although very, very toxic to people, and if this could be used as an adjunct to some of those to lessen the toxic effects, 
Same thing with pain medication. It is a very, very effective pain medication for up to moderate levels of pain. Mm -hmm. And if you mix it with opioids, you have far less dependency issues and addiction issues with the opioids. Mm -hmm. And you can go back and forth and keep the increasing doses of opioids from being a problem for patients. So there's a lot of hope in the future for this stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, you know, uh, I think from what I've read there, it does have a lot of uh, a promise for healing at least certain cancers and uh, mm -hmm. certainly has been very effective for seizures mm -hmm. uh, at least apparently not all cases but uh, for some uh, individuals it works wonders um, you know kids that are used to having uh, have, having to live with epileptic fits you know mm -hmm. um, just totally stopping the, uh, those fits um, I mean that that's a godsend so um, you know, it, it's definitely, um, it, it's not too soon. It's, <laughs> it's been a long time coming, and um, uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more. Uh, well, and interestingly enough, uh, a doctor by the name of O'Shaughnessy went to India in the 1830s and mm -hmm. saw the same thing. Mm -hmm. The Ayurvedic physicians were, were loading children and anybody with seizures up with tinctures under the tongue and stopping seizures. Wow. He brought it back to Europe. Well, it's it's a miracle. It's almost two centuries ago, and here we are just <laughs> rediscovering this. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's crazy. Um, so, uh, did you want to talk about the uh, Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act? Uh, that was so that was passed by the legislature. Mm. Um, what 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 did that provide that um, that you think was, you know, like a good good starting point that this one builds on? Well. It set up the regulatory scheme mm -hmm. that is going to um, license everybody that operates in the commercial cannabis industry. It moves the quali what we call qualified patients out of the commercial industry and keeps them off the side to try to protect whatever rights they may still have under Prop 215. Uh, one of the things that it did very clearly was to take away the collective cooperative model. It was targeted at that group of activities. Mm -hmm. There is the sense out there amongst policymakers and law enforcement that this is just quasi-recreational. It's out of control. There's nothing in that uh, SB 420, we call it, uh, um, that, that allows for dispensaries. But when you can cooperatively grow for people, there's got to be a way to get it. So they tolerated dispensaries and then they just took off. And now there's delivery services everywhere. Mm -hmm. MRSA, um allows dispensaries if a local jurisdiction will permit it. And they don't have to. Mm -hmm. Under our constitutional scheme, every local city and county has the right to control its land and its, and its boundaries. And that includes a total ban for any production of cannabis, period. Uh, and with this new law, though, if that happens, they don't get any of the proceeds that the government's going to be bringing in. Well, so that's the, that's the incentive for the, all these locales to allow it. There is a carrot and stick along those lines. One of the first things that it does is that it takes away the power of a local jurisdiction to totally ban a personal garden. Mm -hmm. It allows six plants and the product of your six plants to be kept on your property. Uh, you can only leave with one ounce or with eight grams of concentrate, but on your property, as long as you keep it secured, whatever your plants produce, you can keep them there. Mm -hmm. And the local jurisdictions can ban you growing outdoors, but not in a greenhouse type of secured building or indoors. Now, that was a bit of a trade-off. They wanted a lot more, but the cities and counties weren't really going to go for that because that's, that takes away their power um, that they can st stop whatever they want to stop. Their sovereignty, basically. Well, the MAMERSA doesn't touch local jurisdiction in that way. The Prop 64 does allow for a small um, personal recreational garden uh, and all the activities involved with that are without jeopardy of being arrested, prosecuted, or asset forfeiture. So from my standpoint, after being sent to prison and seeing people sitting in prison for 10, 15, 20 years for drugs, um, trying to ratchet back some of the criminal penalties uh, from the war on drugs is, is one of the reasons that I wanted to support this. I, I can't say I like everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, some of my supports is much more um, vigorous than other parts of it. 
but it seems like it's come a long way though um, you know it seems like we're making progress uh, there's a general agreement um, uh, about the law and 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 it can always improve as well uh, does it provide for any um, retroactive um, ta uh, uh, how would you say that uh, allowing people who are in jail now mm -hmm. to get out it specifically allows people that are currently incarcerated to petition the court to have their sentences reviewed uh, charges dismissed reevaluate whether they should be allowed to get out for the time they serve if all you have is a, is a conviction for things that will be legal under this law mm -hmm. you should be able to petition to get out yeah. unless the state can prove that you are a danger to society the burden is put on the state to prove that you are something rather than you have to prove you aren't right and so it flips the tables a little bit and if you have not been incarcerated yet but you've been arrested um, you can then have those stopped those charges stopped from being further prosecuted and put you in, in prison and if you have a criminal record you have the record recalled oh, and you can have it cleaned it also takes all activity of kids under the age of 18 and takes it out of the criminal justice system mm. and it sends you to mandatory counseling or, or education and community service yeah, that's excellent. you don't get a criminal record if you're a kid right that's how it should be so we've only got a few seconds left here uh want to sum up or, or cover something we haven't covered real quick? Well, this is 62 pages long. Yeah. You don't have enough time. Yeah. Uh, Where I, can people go to, to read it? You can go to um, Alma's website. You can uh, search it on Google, and you, it'll get all 62 pages of it. It's, it's detailed and very lengthy. Um, do you have anything up yourself on the on a website where, people, where it's like a summary or... A well, I guess we don't yeah, can't yeah. get into that. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dale Schaefer, for coming, and uh, appreciate you uh, talking you. about it with us tonight. Thank you, and good night from Sacramento Soapbox. Susan, but not smart. You lived your life so much in fantasy that reality never had a chance. I want to be free. 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 I want to be free.